Friday. I want to thank the Sheridan in Baltimore North for putting on this great breakfast for us every month. They do an amazing job for us. We could not do this without them. We need that support. Our corporate sponsors, we got to start with them also, Baltimore County Public Library, the Community College of Baltimore County, BGE, Port of Baltimore, the Sheridan Baltimore North, Peak Performance Accounting, T. Rowe Price, McCormick and Company, UMBC, Comcast, as well as Blue Cross Blue Shield. Please give them a round of applause. Those are our corporate sponsors. We really need them. We have a super eventful month upcoming for the month of March. So I'm going to kind of run through a couple ribbon cutting, some upcoming events. So please put them on your calendars. Check out our Facebook page as well as check out our website for some upcoming events. So we're going to be doing a um, ribbon cutting next Monday for One Life Fitness over in the Hunt Valley Shopping Center. That's going to be at 12 p.m. So it's going to be pop out for lunch, do a little bit of networking. Check us out for about 15, 20 minutes. We're going to have some giveaways. We're going to have a lot of dignitaries there as well as a lot of business people from the Hunt Valley area. That's going to be on Mar uh, Monday, March 7th. On Friday, March 11th, we're doing a ribbon cutting for a Pizza Hut franchise over in the Lutherville Foxtel area. Um, check out our website for that. Going to be giving away pizza for an entire year. So if you like pizza, if you got kids, you got a daycare, you got something like that, um, please check us out. We're going to have some other giveaways also. We always bring out a lot of business people from around that particular area. So please check those out. Ribbon cuttings are awesome networking opportunities. You don't got to be there forever. Pop in for 15, 20 minutes, bring a business card, network with us a little bit, take a picture. We're going to definitely put that on our calendar also. We're going to be doing another ribbon cutting on March 19th. Um, that's going to be at the Townsend Shopping Center, um, the mall right down the road, right across the street for Scrubs and Apparel, one of our brand new members. That's going to be on Saturday, March 19th at 1 p.m. And last but not least, one more ribbon cutting on Saturday, March 26th for MHA uh, Healthcare. It's over in the Owens Mills, uh, Owens Mills area. Check out our website and our Facebook for all those websites and as well as for all the addresses for all of those businesses. These are all new businesses that are coming to the Baltimore County area. We want to welcome them and we want them to be successful. And then our next monthly member breakfast will be on April 7th. Our guest speaker will be Sonia Antoine, the director of Baltimore County Public Library. She's new to our community for about a year, but I'm interested to hear her story as well as all the great things she has for for the Baltimore County Public Library. So that's an awesome thing too. Um, we have some brand new members as well as some renewals. So I definitely wanna shout those out because they definitely support us also. And if you are a first timer, if you're a brand new member, raise your hand. I'm gonna let you do a little intro about yourself and tell us a little about your business as well as why you're here. Um, so definitely look out for your name. So we have Scrubs and Apparel, Pizza Hut of, Tim of Timonium, Serene Care Clinics, Ink Inkberry Marketing, uh, one of our renewals, uh, Sandy Spring Bank, Macro Resource, Edward Jones, Dartrans, as well as CTS. Please give them a round of applause for one of our brand new members. And any of our first timers in the crowd? I think I see one here from Edward Jones. Yes. Tell us a little about yourself. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jason Pete. I'm with Edward Jones. I'm a financial advisor. Uh, I help folks build personalized strategies Thank you. Welcome to the group. Any first timers on this particular side? Morning, I'm Bert Jones with NWP, Neighborhood Watch Team Surveillance Group. It's a, uh, I have an arm dealership. I specialize in CCTV surveillance cameras for homes, mainly really homes, but also commercial properties as well. I've been in business for six years now, praise God, and uh, I've made it through COVID, so <laughs> we're good. We're good. Thank you. Welcome. Any first timers in the center? Gentlemen? I'm Tom White from Growth Team Strategies. Uh, we are a, a consulting business that work uh, the four areas of uh, <clears throat> business change, startup, crisis, rapid growth, or transition. And today, because of COVID, we started a virtual networking group, business to business only. So today I'm here to promote that if anybody's interested in finding out a little bit about virtual networking. Um, we found it to be very, very valuable, and it's a little different than any other networking you've been part of. So, perfect. Tom White, Growth Team Strategies. Thank you for joining us, <laughs> sir. Hello, um, 
I am Michael Hunt. I'm new to this, but our organization is not I'm from UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I am the director of the McNair Scholars Program at UMBC, and uh, my role is to help students who are first gen from low income backgrounds as well as um, historically excluded racial and ethnic groups. We help them to get in, not only finish their undergrad degree, but get into graduate school and ultimately within 10 years of graduating from UMBC getting their PhD. So we're really looking forward to it. And even yesterday got to meet with some who are getting accepted to grad school all across the country. Um, so excited about that. And here to network, um, there are many opportunities that we have where we try to get people in front of our students to talk about ideas, especially if you have an advanced degree um, and you're doing something different than the academy, please let me know um, because that's the kind of thing we want students to know that with a doctorate, you don't have to stay in the, um, the academy, like you can branch out. Um, so if you know, if it's you or somebody or your spouse, you, you know, you, you know, like let me know that as well. We're always looking um, to increase support. And then if you have any um, programmatic opportunities that you're like, oh, um, this is something I would think that would be good for your students, or I would love to talk to your students about this, da, 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 please let me know that as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> any other first timers uh, that I need to intro over here? Oh, sir. Thank you, thank you. Kite Technology, one of our newer members from last month, so welcome. Definitely welcome here. Um, any other first timers? Sir? Tino Marquez, Jr., CEO of Express Exterior Design. We're actually exterior, we do, we provide exterior remodeling services. Roofing, windows, siding, gutters, and doors. So if you guys know of anyone who needs a roof, window, siding, gutters, or doors, let me know. Uh, we're local, we're right here in Parkville. We stand behind trust, quality, and integrity. And just remember, your job isn't finished until you're fully satisfied. All right. So I like to hear. Perfect, perfect. Like all the first timers here, um, but I want to intro into our speaker. We have Chris Hudgens. He's the Vice President and General Manager of Sale Advising. He's going to be speaking about NIL today. We partner with him because he's already a partner with one of our members. That's UMBC. They work with them intimately in their athletic department. And if you don't know what NIL is, that's basically allowing collegiate athletes and amateurs of every, of every shape and size and every color to be able to actually get marketing for themselves in their university. So they're going to give us a little bit more intro about that, about how it's affecting local athletes, how it's affecting local businesses, and how you maybe you can get involved in it if you have a student athlete or if you have a business of yourself. Um, and he has some other colleagues that he's going to bring on stage that's going to give us a little bit more information about this particular subject matter. We're a really, really big sports team, a uh, big sports town here in Baltimore. So they're going to give us a little bit more granular information about what's happening behind the scenes. So please give him a round of applause, Chris Hudgens. Thanks, everybody. It's great to uh, be with you today. We really appreciate the opportunity to be here. If I haven't uh, had the chance to meet you yet, I'm Chris Hudgens. I'm with Sale Advising. Sale is also an offshoot of another sports marketing uh, agency called Team Services. Um, but both as part of Sale and Team Services, we're a Maryland-based company. We've been in business for 20 years. We're down the road in Rockville, where our headquarters is. Um, and when I say we, it's because I'm joined here by the founders of both Sale and Team Services. On my left, Fred Freed and EJ Narcisse. And I want to make sure that they get a chance to uh, also introduce themselves before um, I get going. So, Fred. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. I mean, what a, what a great thing that you guys do. Big believer in networking, and it's just so great to see so many great people in this room that are supporting each other's businesses. So kind of what we're going to talk about today is to do just that, see if and how we could support each and every one of your businesses through uh, really unique and new and innovative marketing. Um, our, I'm going to let EJ tell you more about our background. He's more of the Baltimore guy. I'm a Marylander. I'm a Terp, so I will come with those uh, 
credentials and grew up in Maryland, but more out in the D.C. area, spend a lot of time up here. We've had a lot of clients say we have a great relationship with the folks at UMBC, with Dr. Hrabowski and Greg Simmons and, and others, and uh, we've done some great things with Towson as well and with Coppin State, so, uh, and with the Ravens, EJ will touch on all those things, but um, really, really good to be here, We and uh, look forward to following up with you. Thank you, Fred. Um, thank you, everyone. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Anytime we have a chance to come back, myself in particular, many, many years ago, um, when I moved here from New Jersey, I was transferred down here by GE Plastics, uh, looking for a place to live. Ironically, my office was out of Gaithersburg, but my territory was uh, the entire uh, mid-Atlantic footprint. Um, I opened up my atlas and from Jersey to here, and I needed to be somewhere where I could get back home on weekends because I still had a lot going on, and I saw Tosin. And I said, that's where I'm going to be. I'm going to be in Tosin right at the top of the Beltway. And so I lived in that great big old ugly high rise on Allegheny Boulevard. And uh, I was there for about three years. And, and really, this has become home. As I said, that was 30 plus years ago. Um, my history in the area goes back to uh, the uh, old Baltimore Stallions of the Canadian Football League. I got my start in minor league baseball. Uh, came back to Baltimore, had an opportunity to come back here uh, on a number of different occasions, but work there. Uh, we worked very, very closely. Fred and I have started Team Services. We're 20 years old now. Uh, one of our first major projects was uh, the M&T partnership with the Ravens. We were able to, to pull that relationship together and one that we're very, very proud of. But we've worked on a number in this area, Towson University, the CQ partnership, UMBC and the Chesapeake Partnership. Uh, those are arena and facility naming rights deals. So our business is very diverse. NIL is something that is front and center for everyone right now and collegiate athlete. Uh, it's, you know, it will change collegiate athletics uh, forevermore. And uh, Chris is going to get into a little bit more detail, but uh, whether you have kids that are college age or whether you're just collegiate fans in general, um, you'll find this very, very interesting. Uh, the inroads, a lot of it is social media based with influencers, which you hear so much about now, but uh, Chris will get into more detail on that. But again, thank you so much for having us. Just, just also say, please, as you're, we, we try not to put you to sleep or bore you with some of the, the technical things about NIL, but we'll, we'll take you through, you know, why it's here, how it happened, and where we're at now. But please think about your questions, because we want to reserve as much time as possible and answer your individual questions, specifically how it might relate to your business. Thank you. I'll take that one further and say, you know, we'd love for this to be interactive. So if you have questions as we go along, feel free to uh, raise your hand and we'll be sure to get to you. Um, I'm also an adjunct professor at American University and I teach an undergraduate sports marketing class, so I'm used to speaking to a shy audience. So um, by all means, feel free to raise your hands and, and I'll get to you. Um, at the same time, um, you know, we also may talk about different acronyms such as NIL and other nomenclature and if there's ever anything that for a casual sports fan that you don't understand because we do tend to talk in our own vernacular and speak again feel free to uh, to stop us and we'll be glad to give you more context for what it is but we've really just developed this um, brief presentation just to take you through it it really shouldn't take up too much time but and then we do want to get into questions and answers but hopefully it'll uh, give you much further context for what is happening right now with NIL with name image and likeness and where it's headed So as SAIL, we are a premier provider of all things pertaining to name, image, and likeness. So we've set it up first and foremost as a company to tackle and help uh, universities educate their student athletes about what it means and what their opportunity set and how they can maximize it um, and all things pertaining to that. Um, we've really you know, added some other elements based off of our history, our experiences, um, and our expertise you know, where we can certainly uh, be positioned to help brands also navigate this same element and to really identify and find the right student athletes that make the best fit for those kinds of endeavors. When we talk about name, image, and likeness, um, just to take a quick step back, we're really talking about ways that student athletes can commercialize and monetize 
their own ability to afford their name, afford their likeness, to use their social media, and be a commercial endorser for folks. Um, so that's really what you're seeing take place right now. A lot of the news that you may see pertaining to NIL um, happens to be about student athletes making money off of using their platforms, which typically are social media based, uh, to help companies uh, gain awareness and for them to endorse different products and be a part of that whole ecosphere. Um, in terms of just our background, we gave you a little bit about that, but SAIL was really uh, formed by two different local sports uh, agencies. So t as Team Services with EJ and Fred and I are a part of, uh, we joined forces with the folks at Maroon PR, they're Columbia based, um, and they have a different expertise that also comp that really complements what we do from a partnership perspective so that we can provide a really great um, wide swath of services for everyone that we uh, touch when we get involved with NIL. You may know the Maroon PR folks because for a long time uh, their iconic athlete that they have represented out in the market is Cal Ripken. Um, so they have a really great understanding of what it takes you know for an athlete to partner with brands for the personal branding side of things um, and obviously communications and PR in that angle. We certainly come in from our expertise on the partnership side, as EJ alluded to. Um, we've done a number of different partnerships uh, around the country, but certainly in this area. So you mentioned Towson and UMBC, uh, also at College Park, where uh, the Comcast Center, now Xfinity, that's a relationship that we've that we fostered for, for them. So we have a really great collegiate expertise um, in terms of the partnership landscape. And that kind of dovetails also with the work that we do from a corporate marketing standpoint. So we've really taken all of our knowledge and expertise in the partnership space and we apply it to brands as well. So uh, locally, uh, another good instance is a number of years ago, we actually represented PNC Bank when they came into the market through their acquisition of Mercantile and helped them develop and determine what the right strategy was for the partnerships that they needed to have to make a better, better, bigger and better name for themselves in the market. So we do a lot of, uh, a lot of corporate marketing work from that perspective as well. So name, image, and likeness. Uh, I'll get into some of the background into how it came to be, but again, this just uh, speaks a little bit more in terms of um, what we can do from that, from that vantage point. Again, helping brands uh, develop programming that leverages student athletes, uh, whether it's social media based or not. And we'll talk about the whole opportunity set because I'm a big believer that while a lot of the focus is on social media, there's, for a student athlete, there are so many other great opportunities that they have now at their disposal to, to really help themselves and to monetize this space. Um, in terms of colleges, as I mentioned, we're helping a number of different colleges uh, educate their student athletes. So we're doing that at UMBC. We're also doing it at Richmond with uh, VCU. Um, and we're essentially going there, talking to their student athletes directly. We're a human resource where we can really provide them, again, our background in this space, what it means to them, what the opportunity is, certainly what to look out for, because nobody wants to jeopardize a, a college athlete's you know, uh, status especially a scholarship athlete. So what to look out for, how they can go about it, what it means to partner with a company, what kinds of companies they may want to partner with. And then there's the whole compliance end from the collegiate space in terms of what they need to do as a student athlete to make sure everything is above board. So we're providing that education on a daily basis to those institutions and, and more. Um, and then again with the athletes, we have a really great tradition of um, helping companies uh, really find the right athletes. So, uh, we have a number of different network opportunities using our, uh, our expertise to really determine who is the right fit, who should you look for, how can you go get them in a quick way and kind of break down those barriers to, to form those partnerships in the best holistic way. So a little bit about the background of NIL. This slide, as you see it here, is everything that the NCAA has come up with in terms of guidelines for what name, image, and likeness is and how they are um, implementing it into, into, the, into the space. Um, there was a lot of talk about this over the course of a year and beyond, and it all got whittled down into these four bullet points. Um, really what you need to know is that this all was instigated uh, a couple of years ago when California as a state passed legislation about NIL 
And that kind of jump-started the whole process where all these other states felt like they needed to get in line. They wanted to afford their student athletes in their states this opportunity. And Florida really pushed the boundary. And they upped what California was doing to set a deadline of July 1st of 2021. And that became kind of the default de facto uh, deadline date for when all of this was going to take place. So if you go back about nine months ago, everything started with NIL with a number of different states. Um, implementing it and the NCAA had to react. They were really boxed into a corner in terms of what they needed to do and they, com they established some committees to try to tackle it and this is what they came up with. That essentially, the second bullet point, that college athletes who attend a school with an NIL state law, they should follow those guidelines for how to proceed with NIL. If you're in a state that does not have an NIL law, you just go by the school's uh, regulations that they put into place for NIL. So a number of different states have put in these legislations. Um, Maryland has as well, but Maryland's is not taking place until 2023. So that won't go into effect in, for another year. Um, in the meantime, as I'm saying, a lot of these schools have put in their own parameters, their own guidelines. And what it means is what they're saying to their student athletes that they can and can't do in terms of monetizing their their, their, their NIL rights. Yes, please. Just basic, like, you, you don't have to go into deep details, but what do you know of the Maryland one? So what is the Maryland law? So saying? It's extremely basic, and it's really just saying just some of the other typical guidelines that you see from other states, which is typically saying, uh, as an institution and as, as an athletic department, they don't want the schools being involved directly in the deals that the athletes are uh, forming. So they can provide education from a service like, our, like ourselves um, as sale, but they don't want to be the ones that are marrying the brand to the athlete in that capacity. Yes? Um, with the, uh, the portal situation going on, yeah. um, you know, kind of two things. One is, you know, John Jones is the greatest you know, football player in the world. He's at Maryland, and uh, I'm, I'm paying him a million dollars a year, and he transfers to you know, North Carolina State or something. Um, that's going to affect how things are done. But the other side is with 50 uh, different rules on, on the NIL, do you think the feds would get involved and, and like put an, over, you know, an overriding thing on everything? And then that takes care of the, uh, the portal stuff too, because all of a sudden you're popping between schools you go to a state where, oh, well, this is, I can't do this now because the state doesn't let me. Well, that's the best yeah. case scenario <clears throat> for the NCAA. Yeah, it gets them out. They, they would much rather yeah. have it be federally regulated instead of having 50 different you know, uh, suitors that they have to deal with yeah. Yeah. case by case. Um, you won't, you know, you're not going to see, Chris will get into it in more detail, but we really focus on the 99% the of the student athletes. The one percent is the quarterback you mentioned, the, you know, the star basketball player that's going to get a half a million dollar deal. It's the ninety-nine percent. It, it's the field hockey player, the cross-country runner, uh, you know, the softball player. Those are the kids that need to be educated with regard to what their opportunities are. And, and if for no, nothing else, it teaches, it'll it'll teach kids to think about where they're going with their careers. You know, they're not going to be a professional field hockey player. No. So how do they monetize the time and energy they put into field hockey? And you all live this in this fishbowl with Baltimore County. I mean, these kids, are, I mean, it's competitive as hell. And kids are getting scholarships, you know, in just hand over fist in this region. It's really remarkable. And so that pressure kind of builds. But these kids are at this since they're, you know, seven, eight, nine years old. So what we hope to do is really shed some light on where the opportunities are for these kids to start thinking about what it is they'd like to do after graduation and how they can, while they're a sophomore or junior in school, monetize this and maybe find a connection with a company that they want to move forward with. Uh, oh, they have to make that a long term. Absolutely. Do you see it? I work middle school basketball games and I see... Uh, that may be where I know you from, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I coach middle school. So oh, do you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and I have seen the private high schools in Baltimore County recruiting middle school basketball players yeah. to go to their high schools. Right. Do you see this per percolating down? Well, that's been going on forever. That's well no, no, before I mean, NIL. Well, where the high schools it is there. already in some states. 
is it really? And it is, yes. In some states, we had a situation where a young man from uh, Texas graduated early because Texas does not allow high school athletes to be paid. So he left and went to Ohio State a year early because he could. And, and I don't know what that was, a half a million dollar deal. It was a, it was yeah. a significant deal. Yeah, ESPN well, to televise right. high school football. Well, and that's, again, you know, there's, there's no end to this. Yeah. I mean, the, you mentioned the transfer portal. That's, you know, I mean, that was a mistake. Um, well intended, but, but the fact that there's, there are no boundaries right. around it. Essentially now, the kid that's not happy with his playing time, or she can just transfer. So what are we... What are we teaching our kids? Right. You know, it's, it's everything that our parents told us. Keep your head down, work hard, outwork the other person. No, uh, the coach doesn't like me, I'm going to transfer. Uh, so that's really opened that, you know, that faucet. Now, I don't know that there's, you know, there's any going back from that. But NIL is certainly tied to that. And as you said, a brand will have to take that into consideration uh, when they endorse an athlete. Now, that's not happening quite as much, again, in that that 99% category. You're not getting a lot of field hockey players and track people that are transferring, but it is happening in lacrosse, yeah. men's and women's lacrosse. Yeah. Is we'll, it? Uh, really? In we'll get into why this is yeah. so important for the field hockey player and the swimmer, and you know, they can have an impact in, in, you know, locally, and, and we'll get into that a little more. But, um, and for that matter, if it's regulated, and, and cleaned up that high school athletes will be able to do the same with help teach younger kids and other things you know, for the, the most important point here from the NCAA standpoint, whether they intended this or not, you know, it really, it, it's taken the shackles off of student athletes. You know, a, a, a musician, a, a regular student who happens to be a musician can go play on the weekend right. at bar mitzvah and get paid. But a kid that plays tennis in college can't give tennis lessons in the summertime. Well, that's silly. Yeah, well, she can't. Because that makes you a professional. Right. Well, that's nonsense. So that that was really the essence of this was to remove that barrier. It, it's the Kevin Plank thing. He may never may never start an Under Armour if he had been able to uh, get a part time job in college. You know, he, <laughs> I saw him talking. He said, "I did. I started my own business because the NCA didn't say I couldn't." Right. You know. I mean. It, but that was, it's just stupid. NCAA is one Yeah, star. that's a whole other topic. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we agree. Yeah. You, question back there? Yeah, I got two questions. Um, the first question is, I'm pretty sure you guys know, um, with the whole NIL and the transport portal and things like that, college football and college athletics is almost like the wild, wild west. <laughs> yeah. There's no regulation. Anybody can do what they want to do. Um, as far as the legislature, will it ever be regulated? Because I know people who uh, claim that they have sports agencies but aren't licensed in any type of league and they're going out and getting X, Y, and Z and saying, okay, well, I'm gonna get him an NIL. So my question is, are these sports agencies able to make a profit off of the kids' um, NIL deals? I mean, because when you look at uh, Arch Manning, for instance, right now he has almost about $2.3 billion in NIL deals. Would his agents or whoever represents him be able to make a profit off of the money that he makes? And will the NCAA ever regulate the NIL? Because the transport portal, like he said, almost is almost like free agency. You can go, mm -hmm. just for instance, like a kid who just signed with USC, Caleb Williams. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's getting uh, you know real estate endorsements. He's getting car endorsements. He's getting all these type of endorsements. So now what's happening is you're having boosters forming together their own type of groups to now say, all right, well, let's go out and give Joe Blow $80 million for him to come in and play for USC. Will the NCAA regulate this? Because they have to because it's just getting out of control because you have college coaches now making $100 million, uh, $100 million contracts. Mm -hmm. You're going to see the conferences more so than the NCAA really regulating that. And what you're alluding to is you know, these agencies can't be player agents. I think you mentioned to me that you're recently, you know, certified. Um, you can't be a certified sports agent and represent an NIL, like represent an athlete. But see, that can happen now, though. Because, well, I, mean, I mean, you have sports you agencies, have marketing agencies who are right. who are representing kids. Yeah. And so I'm trying to figure out, like, okay, so you got this kid a $100,000 NIL deal. 
what profit are you bringing home for this? Well, you know, no tell. There's always a percentage of it, but I'll be honest with you, with a kid like Manning, they're not interested in the NIL deals. Right. They they're doing them. that to carry favor because what they really want to do is represent this kid down the road. But there is a, you know, there's a great deal of money to be made from a percentage standpoint from you know, a young man like that. But again, that's the one percent we're talking about. That is so few and far between. Yeah. One more quick thing before you go on, because this transfer portal has been mentioned a number of times, but I don't know anything about it, so maybe there's others who also. Yeah, thank you for saying that. So yeah, to take a half a step back, so the NCAA opened up uh, the window for athletes to uh, transfer from one school to another in a way that's immediate. So you can, it's literally uh, perhaps a little bit more akin to a free agency potentially, where an athlete can choose to, to leave the current school that they're at, go to another school and play there and play immediately. So there's not a typical window where they have to sit out, wait, um, and that kind of that that kind of delay. You do you want to? Again, incredibly well intended. You know, you're recruited by a coach to go play at a school, and you're there for one year, and that coach gets a thirty million dollar deal to leave, and now the coach that recruited you is gone. The next coach comes in and has a different style of philosophy, and you're now eight on the depth chart because of that. Um, it, it's only fair that if coaches can leave, why wouldn't kids be able to leave? But there's really not a criteria on it. Yes, ma'am. The scholarship money transfer over with them as well? Well, no, but he doesn't, he can't lose his scholarship because the coach, because there's a coaching change. But the only reason they would leave is that they've gotten a scholarship offer somewhere else. So, in other words, the recruiting never stops. Right. You know, I went through this with my own kids. They, they started recruiting them across in sixth grade, seventh grade, yeah, yeah. and it never. Now it will never stop because even when you're a freshman at North Carolina, that coach is at the summer tournaments in your ear saying, "I noticed you didn't play a lot last year." Yeah. <laughs> and it, so it's it, again, it is yeah. truly wild, wild west. So, so to loop all the way back around, there probably will be federal involvement at some point. In the whole thing, yeah. yeah. When they find the time to worry yeah. about something yeah. like yeah. this. <laughs> Actually, a lot of time to expend quality rather than sure stuff. I, right. I think you mean when they find time to make money off of something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in terms of the opportunity set, we'll talk a little about this in more detail. But for athletes, these guidelines, you know, now they, again, we, as we've alluded to, they can endorse products, they can take part in marketing promotions. Um, some other smaller things, like they can be a part of uh, camps now, and they can run their own camps um, and lend their names to those. So in some ways that's an interesting dynamic because they may be competing with their own coaches um, yeah. for those kinds of camps. But nonetheless, you can see how this whole um, landscape has evolved and, and how broad it could potentially be. Um, for brands and the fact that this is the first time ever that they're able to um, you know, have this kind of connection to a student athlete, um, it's really unique. Um, we put a note in here too because what's, what you should know as well is that as a brand, as a company, you don't necessarily have to have a partnership with the university or the school in order to have that relationship with the student athlete. Now the school is hoping that it's not going to come into conflict with any other partners that they may have in the same kind of business industry as one of their sponsors. Um, but you do not need to, um, to essentially have that, that first relationship with the school or the university to then have the relationship with the student athlete. You can have that totally on its own. Um, most schools, again, they're, they're maintaining an arm's length to all of this, but this is changing as we speak. Um, so we talked a lot about the state legislation that occurred to enact NIL. A lot of that is now being unwound. So you have a number of states saying, we don't want those parameters in place anymore because the universities have determined, well, there's really nothing to say that we can't do those deals and we can't broker them with student athletes. So a lot of that is starting to become unwound and that arm's length distance that athletic departments and schools are utilizing to not be involved in the deals, that's shortening. And they're now getting involved with the deals. They want to make sure that the student athletes are hopefully creating deals, monetizing them, and that all just goes back to the whole recruiting angle um, for why it would be great for a student athlete to be there. So on that, the arm's length and shortening of it, could there be a conflict though where, I'm just wondering, 
where, let's say, CQ, a kid at Towson mm -hmm. on the basketball team plays at the CQ Arena, and uh, MIT Bank wants to sponsor a kid there. Wouldn't the college want to discourage that? I think I think they would they would like to. There's nothing to necessarily say that they they can't. Okay. Um, but again, that student athlete at the same time they may not have the same abilities to also use their connections to the university in terms of, you know, uh, they can't give uh, M and T in that situation the marks for uh, for Towson, you know, to to utilize as part of the promotion. That that student athlete just has to utilize their name or their image, you know, not that that kind of an affiliation. Right. Correct. Correct. So they'll. So a lot of people get around it by utilizing similar color schemes and things like that. But yeah, you wouldn't see, you know, the the Towson logo of any sort. Um, so in terms of why why companies why are they why are they utilizing student athletes? You know, what makes this an important endeavor for them? There's a whole host of reasons, and the first and foremost starts with the fact that the student athletes are incredibly plugged in and they are the gateway to what is now you know the most sought after demographic which is Gen Z so the student athletes are extremely relatable they offer a number of authentic stories about their backgrounds and themselves they're extremely savvy in terms of social media and the kinds of content that they can create that's engaging that's creating a following they're highly engaged with those followings more so than you know a typical um, you know personality or celebrity I would say um, and those followings can be quite diverse. So those can vary depending upon the sport that they're in, their gender, where they are geographically, their race, and their background. So uh, this is really at the core of why a number of these different brands are, are latching on to the student athlete. Um, they're also quite economical in terms of other related uh, you know, costs with partnering with an athlete. So there's been a study done in basically over the first uh, eight months of NIL uh, the average Division One athlete agreement is for about six hundred and eighty-six dollars. Okay, so you see in the news a lot of reports about these mega mega contracts. Again, that's the one percent of, of of where all these deals are headed. Um, but for most student athletes, when they get into these, you know, it's much less significant in terms of the monetary uh, return. If you look at Division Two and Division Three athletes, that number goes down even further. So that's just a snapshot into Division One. Which I would just tack on to that, that. Think of the brands and the opportunity for the brands to, to tell a story. So you got a kid that might have been a walk-on, and she you know, came from a, a challenged upbringing, and she walked on in school. You know, that $686 deal is huge for that young lady. And so we talk about authenticity, when we talk about influencers, we talk about stories that really relate to our audience. And, and Chris mentioned the following Kids. So, you know, their social media following skews somewhere between 12 and 16, 17 year olds. So as you look at, as you're positioning your brand moving forward, how vitally important that is. So there's, there's real opportunity for brands to do good here while doing well. Yes. Is there a market for student-athlete alumni? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I played volleyball and basketball at Harvard, yeah. so it's a bit sweet. But um, you know, just <laughs> throwing it out there. Like a there you go. <laughs> How about beer? What about that? Big following. Um. So here's, uh, again, the full kind of opportunity set. I love when we give this presentation to the student athletes and show this because so much of the focus, again, is on social media, as it should be, because th that's a really impactful way for, for brands to get involved, for them to monetize uh, their rights. But there's a wide swath of different ways that student athletes can utilize their own NIL. So when we go and talk to students at UMBC or VCU, and they're not at that 1%, you know, many of them think, geez, well, you know, maybe I don't have a social media following. I don't, I can't use NIL. Well, the fact is you can. Um, because in addition to all the different ways that you can, you know, lend your social media and be a part of the social and digital content creation that's out there, um, I love this bottom right portion where the student athletes can get involved, as EJ said, in terms of giving lessons in their sport. 
they can monetize NIL for something that's not even related to their athletic talents. So if they're a great musician, they can go down and they can now, you know, play that gig at the bar. Um, I love seeing the examples, and we'll show you some of kids who they may have, they may be really artistically inclined. They can now sell their artwork um, as part of NIL. So there's just a whole opportunity set in addition to the typical things of getting you know, paid for signing autographs, doing speaking engagements, lending their name to billboards and other associated uh, you know, kind of commercial advertising. And I should mention, you know, when we talk about the social media space and, and the digital space, I mean, just to give you an example, there's actually a female golfer at Towson University right now whose social media dwarfs the entire athletic department's social media channels combined. She has a social media following on Instagram that is well over 50,000 people. So you can just start to see some of the numbers and, again, why people are, are getting involved with, uh, with a number of these athletes. So we'll finish up just by showing, again, just some ex relevant examples so you can see it kind of in action and taking place. Um, these are a couple of bigger brands, more national brands, again, utilizing um, student athletes to promote their own associations. You have Chipotle with Ozzy Fudd, who is actually a high school basketball player down the road at St. John's uh, High School in DC. She's now at the University of Connecticut. She built a brand partnership with Chipotle. Um, you have, you know, again, now that's a UConn athlete, a bigger, you know, prominent sport athlete, but it's affecting somebody at a school like East, East Tennessee Baptist University, where this athlete was able to partner with, uh, with Dairy Queen. Um, there are many national brands that are getting involved with NIL, so Degree w really jumped into the space very quickly. They created what a, a whole team of student athletes that they called their Breaking Limits team. They basically asked various student athletes around the country to submit why they should be a part of this team. It was a team devoted to, you know, essentially breaking barriers and their stories behind that. Again, hearkening back to those authentic stories that they have, and they selected a team of athletes to be part of this Breaking Limits team. Um, the folks at Mission Barbecue, they went, you know, kind of another step, and they decided to partner with the entire offensive line at uh, the University of Wisconsin. So that the whole offensive line is benefiting from, from Mission Barbecue um, and their food, certainly, nonetheless. You lost money on that, too. <laughs> a lot of food. But we're, we're showing you a number of different kinds of brands, bigger brands, but it's absolutely, you know, affecting the local, regional level. You know, the mom and pop brands that are down the, store, that, down the streets from the universities, everybody can get involved in this. So beyond social media, I mentioned, you know, here's just a couple of different examples of those students who are utilizing their non-athletic talents to, to be paid through NIL. Uh, a student athlete, you know, starting their own clothing line. Um, I mentioned the, uh, you know, the football player at SMU, he's the one who is a really talented artist and now he opened up a gallery where he could sell his, uh, his artwork. You know, another, another player um, with their music talents. So from those happen to be, the last two just happen to be football players, but again, this is also the field hockey player, the fencer, the swimmer, the track and field athlete. And that's really, what, you know, again, those Olympic sports are kind of where the, the student athletes can really benefit in certain ways more than just the, the higher end, you know, football and basketball players. And that 860 or 686, I forget the number, is including, you know, the, the, the person that's now in math. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, kids are also, you know, using this wisely and something that we're also, you know, trying to really extol to them is making sure that when they are doing something that it's benefiting their own personal brand. Because as we said, you know, a number of these kids aren't going to go on and play professional sports. So how can NIL really set themselves up and help them for their 40 year career once they graduate? Um, and this is a great way to really lend your personal brand in a way that they're utilizing NIL, but they're also giving back through it, through philanthropy. So a couple of different examples of, you know, an athlete who's using Cameo, an online service where you can pay the athlete to give a personalized video message. A portion of their proceeds are going to go back to a charity that they're really involved with. Um, another player who's using their NIL to create uh, a back to school kind of giveaway for disadvantaged youths. So in summary, you know, again, those are just some of the examples that, that we wanted to share with you and to give you, you know, more context for the space. But 
Um, we are truly passionate about this area for student athletes, um, for how it can transform their lives, be a part of it. We'd love to ha we love helping brands through it and to navigate it and to set up the best partnership possible. Uh, we'd be delighted to help you guys in any way possible. If, if you feel like this is an appropriate avenue for your business or you, know, you even have uh, some other tie to a student athlete and just want more uh, information and consultation about it, as we've alluded to a number of times, we're down the road. We love being a part of, of the Maryland community and, and helping Maryland-based uh, folks. So um, by all means, if there are any other questions, we would be delighted to take those again now or answer anything else for you. Thanks very much. You all heard the expression, don't try this at home. So, uh, <laughs> The great thing about NIL is it can be pretty low stakes from an entry standpoint. We saw the $686 production's pretty low, but you can really tie a message that frankly can go viral um, if you do it right. You know, you just, you just look around, whether it's uh, security, you know, through your IT, or you know, thinking uh, broadly about your business and, and, and everything else balance and precision and attention to detail. These young people, let's not forget, they're really achievers. I mean, student athletes, I know we, we hire a lot of student athletes because it's, they've done things at a young age that frankly I wasn't doing. You know, EJ was a, was a student athlete and I wasn't. And I was a screw up in Maryland. And you know, somehow I got to here, but you know, well, whatever that means. But they really are, they, they, they're achievers, they work hard, they're, they're really on it, so to speak. And I think that can be personified. And we're huge fans and were huge fans of NIL well before it was enacted because of all the reasons that were demonstrated here. First of all, to your point about some of the larger players, they should be making a lot of money. Um, they're bringing a lot of money into their, into their schools. Um, but all these kids, they work so damn hard and they should be able to use these four years to set up their future put some money in their pocket, uh, but also make the sorts of rela relationships and even business relationships with people in this room. You know, people that go to Towson and Hopkins and UMBC and all these local schools should be. So that's my preaching. Oh, next time you talk, you're talking to Mike. Oh, okay. okay. It sounds like uh, okay. Here you go. <laughs> I thought you were back on the lead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so how, how do you protect the students or uh, uh, like um, or educate them in the, the decision-making process who 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 has their back in this process yeah so when we talk to the student athletes we like to say we do their compliance officer does at the oh I'm sorry the compliance officer does at their athletic department and their athletic department in general should be the ones at right now who do have their backs many of them also through this legislation they can get outside assistance so hopefully they will have somebody who has their back in terms of creating a contract making sure it's done the right way um, but we really try to go in there and make sure they know that they do have all of those resources at their disposal so that they can make the best possible decision and, and yeah. create the best partnership because some of them, uh, you know, most of them will not have an agent watching out for them or a credible agent for that matter. And there are things that we want to, through working for you, we'll make sure that comply, all the compliant uh, check marks are done so that the student is, athlete is protected and doing things the right way. Their school is happy and supportive of the program because most schools have a system in place now where putting a system in place so that they can be behind the program and checking it off. This is a, this is a great thing for them to be doing. Go ahead. So thinking outside of the box a bit, I know a school in the university and he's pulled himself together with a couple other that are in their weather uh, program. Uh, and they're going to go to Stormy. So they put up a, a GoFundMe page. And uh, I've been encouraging this student for a while. And I had been thinking before I came to this or knew anything about your presentation about maybe my company can sponsor them in some way. So was that a conversation you would have you know, that help you think through like what would be the boundaries and the principles of what should be asked for or asked them not to do or keep learning? 
Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I think that once, no, and, and I, but, <laughs> go the other way. No, but, it, but, but to your point, yes, absolutely. And it's really just thinking through it and expanding that box as you look at it. Because whether you're interested in recruiting student athletes for internships or, but once you identify what your criterion is, what your goals and objectives are, you know, by sponsoring, I mean, where do you see the end game by doing this? That's when you can start to lay out what you're asking them for, whether they're social media posts, an appearance, uh, you know, joining you for a session with your colleagues, those type of things. But it's really, it's wide open. So as you start to think about, you know, uh, you have a, you mentioned the gym that's opening, it's a new partner here. I mean, think about, you know, student athletes in the summer, where are they working out? You know, I mean, what a great opportunity. We, we definitely want to talk to them. So, <laughs> you know, but it's really, it's opening your mind to it and looking at that. And then the last thing I'll say is in reference to um, internships. You know, we, you know, many, many years ago, this guy started with me as an intern. Uh, we're always looking for, for talented young people that want to be in this business. So if you know of anyone, you have friends, or please don't hesitate to reach out to us or have them reach out to us. We'd love to talk to them. Yeah. Did you guys provide like a matchmaker service? So company A wants to do a particular type of marketing. Do you say, okay, we have a kid in Towson, we got a kid in Goucher, how does that work? Yes, and we do a lot of that work through team services too. We, we book, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of athlete appearances per year. So that's part of what we do is that kind of search mission. But I think that you, you touched on something, EJ, it's really important to work with, with a company like yours. It's not, first of all, we want to make sure that, you, that, that you're fairly compensating the athlete, meaning that you're not overpaying. But more importantly, it's the deliverables. So what you are paying, because let's face it again, it's not $2.3 million, it's $1,000. What's most important is what are you going to exactly. get from that because we want to make sure that matches up with your end goal. Sure. And that's what we're somewhat expert at. Uh, what, are, what do you see as uh, some of the pitfalls, problems, concerns about NIL that maybe we haven't been hearing about? They're, they're 19 and 20. <laughs> and uh, only because I've had a couple of 19 and 20 year olds can I say that you know, you just don't know what you're getting. Um, there isn't an agent involved. There's, you know, so it's really, you know, uh, you have to do your, your homework. You have to know who these kids are. You have to really scrub their social media and understand what you're looking for and identifying them. And that's not really difficult, but um, I think that how much of it we put on the kids, we expect, we just assume because you know, they're digital natives that they know how to do a video and they, so we've run into brands that have struggled with that where the quality of the video wasn't quite what they would hope it would have been. Uh, so it's making sure that you're very clear in uh, communicating what your objectives are and what the expectations are. I don't know, I don't know if you have anything. Yeah. Um, quick question, um, with a lot of the conferences considering going to in a uh, employee format, Would that have an effect on um, the NIL moving forward when the schools can now pay athletes, especially, you know, you know, like football players and basketball players, where they can technically play, pay them to be an employee at their university? Would this have any impact on the NIL moving forward? Well, it, it definitely will, but, but my opinion, you know, paying student athletes in world peace Okay, I mean, because <laughs> how you figure that out, I mean, I just don't know how. I mean, because, I mean, the, I mean, I mean just think, like, a university of Alabama could, could afford to have right. employed, pay their right. employees or pay their players as employees. You know, University of, of Georgia could afford to play, mm -hmm. you know, their top quarterback as an employee. Right. And with the Big, uh, and with the big Ten potentially cracking on a billion-dollar TV deal, you know, that can open up grounds for some of these schools to be able to pay. Yeah, and that conversation will go on forever. Yeah. I mean, it, how you equalize that amongst all the other schools, um, you know, that's going to be the challenge. You're going to end up with 15 schools playing college football. Yeah. And it, it'll be the second coming of the NFL.
Uh, so, you know, I mean, it's, it'll be debated forever. But yes, it would certainly have an impact on NIL. If you look at college football, it's probably the only other entity that can really take compete with the NFL because of, you know, how much money that some of these programs are bringing in. Mm -hmm. No doubt. No doubt. Anyone else? All right. Thank you again. Really appreciate your time. Appreciate it. I need your help. I need one person's help here. We do do our Southwest Airlines giveaway. So we're gonna wait one Southwest Airlines pass. Come on, keep it fair, keep it fair. Okay, if you pick your own, I can't choose you. No, no, I'm not in there. There no. we go. All right, who we got? Deborah, Deborah Slavinsky from, uh, from Sheridan, Baltimore North. How you doing? Thank you. Awesome. She's in way. She said she had to go visit her daughter in South Carolina too. I, I, I didn't. I didn't do this at all. But thank you guys for coming out. Really, really appreciate it. As I said, our next breakfast will be on April seventh, and we have a ton of ribbon cuttings up, upcoming for the next month. So please check those out, and please network for the next 20, 30 minutes. We have the room. Have a great day.